Now let's turn to Jeffrey Sachs, perhaps the most famous living development economist. Sachs has had a wide-ranging career which has in some ways tracked the course of world events. It spanned both development practice and research into development economics. He spent most of his career, by the way, at Harvard University and later at Columbia. Sachs is pretty well known to the general public, in part because he spent time associating with various movie stars and rock stars, so Jeff Sachs really is the economist as celebrity himself. But we're going to look at another angle of his work, namely his impact on the theory and practice of economic development. But if you're thinking, hmm, Sachs, isn't that the guy I saw with Angelina Jolie? Well, that's probably right. Sachs first made his name as an economist in the early 1980s. He wrote a series of papers on international trade, exchange rates, and international policy coordination. And in the 80s, he became tenured at Harvard as one of the youngest full professors at Harvard ever. If you're interested in reading Sachs on international trade, there's a good synthetic 1995 paper he did, which is online. It's called Economic Reform and the Process of Global Integration. In that paper, he talks about how the opening up of economies to trade is really is a prerequisite and driver of further policy reform. But although this work on international trade had a real impact, it's actually not what Sachs is best known for today. Sachs moved more into the public eye in the mid-1980s with the Bolivian reforms, especially the reforms against hyperinflation. In 1985, the government of Bolivia asked Sachs if he would come down and help them with their economy, and he came up with a comprehensive, fairly drastic plan for ending their hyperinflation and reforming their economy. By no means did this plan fix all or even most of their problems, but it did help the Bolivians end the hyperinflation, and overall it can be judged a success. It was a form of what later came to be called shock therapy. Plans of this sort were based on tight controls over the money supply, freeing up prices, and liberalizing the economy. Sachs's connection to this so-called shock therapy continued, and indeed it intensified, as Eastern Europe started to throw off communism in the late 1980s. At that point, it was then necessary to have plans for reform. Sachs visited Poland, and he was very important there as an advisor, and as an advisor for dismantling the communist system and moving toward a market economy. Again, Sachs's recipes were often fairly drastic, namely the sense that an economy could, and indeed should do a lot of things up front, very quickly, to re-establish a market economy right away. With the passage of time, I would judge shock therapy in Poland actually to have been quite a success. Lately, Poland has been growing rapidly, and it really has joined the community of Western European nations as a more or less equal partner. In Russia, the use of shock therapy was more controversial, because it was accompanied by a series of privatizations, which led to a lot of corruption and redistributed wealth in a manner which many people consider unjust. In fairness to Sachs, these privatizations in Russia happened after he left the country and stopped serving there as an advisor. Nonetheless, the important point here is that shock therapy remains a somewhat controversial concept. By the way, if you'd like to read Sachs on shock therapy, I recommend this piece, which is available online. In any case, you can already see that Sachs has been extremely important as a practitioner of the science and art of economic development. Moving back to economic theory and research, Sachs has had an important piece on what is called the natural resource curse. It resurrected the notion that possibly countries could experience growth problems precisely because they had natural resources. That this natural resource might make the country more corrupt, or it might make them rely too much on those natural resources. We consider this argument in more detail in our video unit on the natural resource curse, so I would refer you to that. Needless to say, Sachs made important contributions in this area, and he brought up anew what had been an old, and at the time, somewhat abandoned debate. Sachs has been an important researcher on African economic growth, and why it has chronically been so slow. Sachs attributes many of Africa's economic problems to its unique geography, a lower productivity of the soil, greater problems with rainfall and also demography, Africa has an especially high youth dependency ratio, that is, a lot of young people who need to be supported. 
and Africa has many more infectious diseases which need to be worried about. When you put all these factors together, according to Sachs, Africa faces really some very special burdens in attempting to achieve economic growth. In particular, Sachs co-authored a piece called The Economic Burden of Malaria, which looked closely at just how much malaria held back the economies of Africa. The problem of malaria is not only that it kills people, but also when you're young, if you're infected by malaria, it stunts your physical growth, it may stunt your brain growth, and it can lead to long-lasting and persistent problems. The importance of infectious disease has been a recurring theme of Sachs's work on Africa. For a summary of a lot of Sachs's thought on this topic, I would refer you to his piece, Institutions Don't Rule, and also Alex's video on Geography Development Disease, which talks about Sachs's ideas here at much greater length. More recently, Sachs has been at the forefront of the Millennium Villages Project in Africa, which is being done jointly with the Earth Institute at Columbia and also the United Nations. The idea here is really quite ambitious, that a sufficiently comprehensive program of foreign aid can help targeted villages escape a poverty trap and blossom into economic development. This has occasioned a lot of debate, and we have an entire video just on the Millennium Villages project, and so I'll refer you to that. Needless to say, this project has captured a lot of media attention, and right now it's the single biggest project which Sachs is most closely identified with. Sachs has done so many different things of importance in development economics, and I've tried to offer references to each as we've been going along. I also apologize to many of Sachs's co-authors. We just haven't had time to mention them all. Sachs also has numerous books. If you're going to read just one, I think the best one as an introduction to his thought is the one called The End of Poverty. In any case, there's plenty of Sachs available online and free. Keep in mind that what's really special about Sachs as a development economist is this dual role as advisor slash practitioner and researcher.